Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Lydia's Booktastic Podcast. I'm Lydia and I love reading so I decided to put this podcast together to tell other boys and girls around the world about the books that I read and what I think of them. In this episode we will be chatting with the author of The Secrets of Grindelwood series, Jackie Burke. Hi, Liddy. How's it going? Good. Episode 18. Whoa, yeah. we're back podcasting regularly now again. Yeah. How does that feel? Good, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, uh, considering the weather that's out there over the last few weeks, we might as well do it. Yeah. Rain, 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 rain in Ireland all the time. So come Except here. Except yesterday was really sunny. That was, that's true. You get the odd sunny day, yeah. So come here, before we talk to our special guest today, Jackie Burke, and she has a new book as well, Harp Maiden. Yeah. So we're going to be asking her about that as well. So before we talk to Jackie, I wanted to ask you a little thing. What were you doing last night? Up till midnight? I was watching the Eurovision. The Eurovision Song Contest. Where was it being held? I think it was in... Uh, Rotterdam. In the Netherlands, yeah. What did you think of it? Was it brilliant? Yeah. And uh, who won? Italy. And what kind of song was it? Was it kind of a Pavarotti song? They had a giant rock in Italian In a rock band in Italian? Wow, that must have been fun. So did you think they deserved to win? Was it a good song? Yeah. What was your favourite song? El Diablo. El Diablo. What is El Diablo? Who was that? Uh, Cypress. Cypress. Yeah, it was Cypress. So was it kind of of a dancey tune? Yeah. I thought so. So overall, you like the Eurovision? Yeah. I'm sure there's a book out there about the Eurovision. Maybe we can check that out and we could probably review that. Yeah, it'd probably show like the winners. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I think we'll do that. So look, we're on episode 18. So we're going to be talking to Jackie Burke today. Jackie's from Ireland. She's an Irish author and she's really, really prolific with The Secrets of Grindelwood. I think you love these books, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you've read a few of them at this point. So uh, what what do you think of overall as the story? Tell me, just let's go back over again, because I know we reviewed one of the books in one of our previous episodes. But I wanted to ask you um, again, this uh, book series, is it for boys and girls? Yeah. And is it kind of scary or is it just kind of fun? Uh, scary, but and both both fun and scary. Right. So um, in terms of the age group, maybe uh, eight to ten, would you say? Yeah. Okay. So um, you do like these books, though, don't you? Yeah. And they are kind of what? What? How would you describe them? Are they kind of fantasy or what? Um. Well, there's lots of magic in them. Mhm. Well, um, the best word for to explain magic in a good way, I guess, is spellbinding. You know, because of magic spells and all. That's what I always think. And um, well, it sometimes can be a bit scary. But it's also cool. That's brilliant. That sounds really good. I mean, it's good fun. So what we'll do is I think we will take a quick break and then we will have a chat with Jackie. We'll be giving her a call on the special uh, Booktastic phone number. So we'll be back in a second with part two. Welcome back to part two of Lydia's Booktastic Podcast. Liddy, we are here. We are ready to go, are we? Yeah. Good stuff. So what are we going to be doing? I think we're going to be speaking to Jackie now, will we? Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, so let's see if we can get her on the line. I'm just going to do the magic Lydia phone call. Ready for this one? Right. So the let's book see. phone. The book phone. Yeah, that's what you call it, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll give her a quick wheel. Let's see if she's on the line. Hello. Hi, Jackie. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning, Ken. How are things? Not too bad. Um. <laughs> good morning, Lydia. <laughs> good morning. So Lydia's a little bit. She's a little bit off counter today. She was up till midnight, Jackie, watching the Eurovision Song Contest. So you will excuse us, but once she gets into the swing of it, I'm sure she'll be fine. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I think we were all watching that. Very exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. I mean, I was just saying there should be a book out there, so maybe Lily should review that on the Eurovision. That would be fun. (laughs) So, Jackie, thanks for joining us today on this windy and rainy day in Ireland for our podcast listeners out there. It's not good weather, so we're all indoors, I think, for the millionth time over the last few months. Yeah, great opportunity to read lots of books. That's it, exactly. You're well in there. Very good, very good. So um, what we'll do is we will kick off um, just a little bit of thing about you, Jackie. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing over the last, um, say, year or two with your books. Yeah, certainly. Well, um, I came to the end of the Grindlewood series, five books there. So 
in the lockdown, I had lots of time to write more books. And I whizzed through my next series, Heart Maiden, books one, two and three, especially last year, because with the schools closed and that, I didn't get to visit that many schools in person, certainly some of them online. But I'd loads of time for writing and uh, I seem to get quicker and quicker with each book I write. So I had lots of time to do that and I'm now proofing a few of them this, this year. So pretty busy, really, between writing and contacting schools and libraries again now. So it's great. And of course, they're back open soon. So it's uh, it's, it's yeah. back on the trail. It's like, you know, the author is it, getting to schools and, and, and libraries is like the, the, the author's version of a rock star tour, isn't it? Well, it kind of is. And it's lovely to meet all the readers and hear all their questions mm-hmm. and talk about reading and writing and there's great enthusiasm in the schools and that kind of inspires authors to keep writing and write lots lots of exciting books for all their readers. So yeah. it is a great part, a great fun part of it because when you're writing, you're all alone and it's in a quiet room and you're thinking and writing and then when you go into the schools, it's all lively and exciting and full of chat and, and, and questions and enthusiastic readers all wanting to know all about books. So it's great. Super, super. And Liddy, of course, you're a big fan of these books, aren't you? Yeah. So Liddy, maybe you can tell our listeners um, what, draw you, what draws you to this book. Why did you like that series so much? It's full of magic. Okay. And do you mm. think magic is a, big, is a big plus when you're writing a book? Yeah. Great. So what, what um, Jackie, when you were um, starting off writing the books, um, what inspired you to start writing children's books overall? Well... I've always loved reading and writing, and I've been hooked on the idea of magic and adventure since I was Lydia's age. And they were the kind of books I like to read all the way back to when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, and all the way up to right now. I still read lots of magic and adventure books. And I always dip into the things that I like when I'm writing. So magic, adventure, and in the case of Grindlewood, animals and children going on adventure. And of course, the big plot is good versus evil. So I started off the idea with four little animals, a cat, a dog, a rabbit and a fox. And I thought I'd be writing another short story. I'd written lots and lots of short stories, but I'd never tried to publish any. I just really had it as a hobby. But with this idea, I suddenly found I had a huge idea in my head. So I abandoned my plan and I just kept writing down all my ideas I didn't mind how much of a jumble it was in. And by the time I got to the end of it then, I discovered I had a huge, huge story, over 125,000 words. And I decided, right, I can rework and rewrite this into a whole series on magic and adventure and the children with their pets uh, saving Grindelwood. So I rewrote it and turned it into five books, the Secrets of Grindelwood series. And then I published them and I found all of a sudden I was an author after many years of wanting to be. Wow, that's um, I mean so it's it was, I think what what ins- what what amazed me was that you had a kind of you didn't have a, a set idea. I mean you didn't go like say block by block by block with the story. It was kind of like loads of different ideas thrown into a mm. book and then you you more or less just picked out what 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 kind of uh, sequence it would go in. That's right. I had this huge messy draft by no means perfect, but I was able to then rework it into the five books. And indeed, I had so many ideas that I didn't even use them all in the end. I was able to build on the ideas that I selected as the best ones and build a story from book one all the way through to book five. And the story does get bigger and bigger and bigger with each book as it happens. Okay, I think what we were thinking about, we were going to ask you the next question was, what was your inspiration behind the Grindelwald series? But I think that's more or less covered. So Lily, you have the next question here. How How did you think of the name Grindelwald? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And when I answer it in the schools, the teachers love us and the librarians do too. This is what happened. I had my big messy draft and I started to rewrite it properly into five books. And when I was halfway through writing the first book, I stopped. And I said, gosh, I've got to pick a name for this story. I was fairly sure it was going to be called The Secrets of Something, but I hadn't got the place name. And I wanted somewhere that sounded magical and a little bit unusual, but not too strange. And I kept coming up with silly names. So do you know what I did? I took out my Scrabble. You know the game, the board game Scrabble? Yeah. Most of us know Scrabble. And I put down a few ordinary words. And the first one I liked was Candle. C-A-N-D-L-E. 
And bit by bit, I changed a letter here and there. And eventually I got from candle to crinkle, from crinkle to grinkle, and then from grinkle to grindle. Wow. (laughs) And I added the word wood, and I said it out loud, grindle wood. And I immediately said, yes, that sounds like the place I can see in my head, the place I'm writing about. And then I said, hold on, what about Jamie and Jemima Grindle? Yes, that sounds okay. Because I thought Jamie and Jemima Candle sounded kind of silly. It is, yeah. So that's why I abandoned it and moved on to Candle and then eventually got to Grindle. And then I got to Grindlewood. Yeah, it's amazing because, yeah, you think like, I mean, uh, you know, uh, that there's a bit more of a uh, science to it, but actually I can see Mm. there is a science to it. You were working it through and it's nice that, of course, that you that you actually had a, say, a kind of use the word play on it as well, too. Yeah, exactly. And I used that method to make up a couple of the other unusual names in the book. For example, the eagle is called Gildevard. And what I was trying to do there was to use a lot of the letters out of Golden Eagle and move them around and make it into a name. And that took a while because it's an awkward name, Gildevard. But I thought it sounded like the serious character that he is, but also a character you never know all the way through the series if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Yeah. And that was the plan. I, I, can I, I'm asking an, an adult question here and Lydia's just running through a few questions herself here but is there a kind of an Irish influence at all in anything when you're writing? Um, that's a very interesting question. I think there is a sort of Irish folklore in the background hmm. that sense of magic and wonder. I always loved, for example, stories like The Children of Lear and Oisin and Tiernan Og and all those kind of Irish myths and legends and I suppose at the back of my mind, there is that influence, but maybe not copying it in any way, right. but just that sort of influence of magic and also using a lot of nature. I think there's a lot of nature in a lot of old Irish stories, and that's something that I really love. And I often tell children to write about things they like. It's certainly a good place to start. And that's really what I found myself doing all along. And nature, I think, is a huge part of that. How did you think of the pet names? Well, now, with every character, I try to give them a name that suits their character in the story, what they're like and what they're doing. But Timber and Teddy are very special. Timber the dog is based on a dog called Timber, who quite by chance, when I started writing the book, I met. And my husband and I went up to Northern Ireland to meet a lady who breeds these dogs, these Malamutes. And one of the dogs that was there that day was Timber. And I was so impressed by Timber. He inspired me to write about him. And I rang the lady up and I said, listen, I'm writing a book. And I'd like one of the main characters to be Timber, the Alaskan Malamute. She said, that's marvellous. I'll send you his photograph. So she did. And just looking at that photo, I was inspired to create a really strong character in Timber, the Alaskan Malamute, who will lead the Grindlewood army on all their adventures. And then Teddy the cat is based on a cat that belonged to a neighbour of mine, but he spent all his time in our house and garden. So I got to know him really well. He was almost like he belonged to me. So as soon as I was writing the story, I felt Timber and Teddy were in my head. So I modeled those two particular animals very closely on the real ones. And then all the other animals, as I said, I tried to pick names that suited them, what they looked like and how they behaved and what sort of personality they had. Do you have Uh, pets yourself? Well, I do now, but at the time when I was starting to write Grindlewood, I didn't. Um, At the moment, we have a huge, big, fluffy cat called Millie, who definitely could be in a story. There's no doubt about it. And pets, I think, whether they're your own pets or somebody else's, they can be a great inspiration for a story. You can just imagine what they could get up to if they had a secret power, if they go wandering off in the middle of the night and one day you followed them to see what they were up to. Anything could happen. Jackie, who was the illustrators in the books? Because we find that the illustrations are really unique. They're not your kind of typical comic book style. Yeah, well, for Grindlewood, the 
illustrator there is Fintan Tate, uh, an Irishman who lives in Dublin. And I also have an Irish girl called Rachel Corcoran who's doing the illustrations for my new series, Heart Maiden. So I was delighted to be able to ask Irish people and keep as many Irish people involved in the production of the book as possible. Well, that's really great. That's really important. And I just wanted to ask you, how how is it, like, say, for an aspiring author, in terms of working on a book, at what point does an illustrator come into the project? Well, with me, uh, right at the end, really, I had to get my book, uh, you know, absolutely right first. Because if you're going to make any substantial changes, it could affect some characters and maybe even how they look. Yeah. So... I was finished writing the book. It had gone to the editor or was at with the editor, but there were no substantial changes or anything. So then I sat down with the illustrator in both cases, both books, and um, I explained the story. Sometimes an, an illustrator wants to read the book or sometimes they just want a summary. Right. Um, and then you talk through what the character looks like. Because generally, I will have described the characters in the book. So they do need to look at least a little bit like them. And I did show them pictures of Timber and Teddy. So that was easy enough. And then, really, it's up to the illustrator to design something in their own style and the way they, they like to draw. So I suppose I would have checked out a style of drawing before we even sat down to have a chat, just to make sure, first of all, that I liked it. And once I liked it, and then it was a matter of would they like to do the book? And then we agree on a cover. I see. And so, in terms of it, there's, there's a process that it, with, with, say, you might, can you imagine if you got to a point where, say, you worked with an illustrator and you weren't happy with their work? Is it a case that you would continue with that illustrator or do you find that, that there could be a situation where you might go to somebody else? In other words, would you have a backup illustrator? And is that, Does that work at all in, in that way? Well, I, luckily, I didn't have that situation. Um, it could be tricky because, um, yeah, gosh, I mean, it's an expensive thing to get done. That's what I was thinking of, would, yeah. Yeah, you have to pay a certain amount up front and there, you need to agree in advance just mm -hmm. how many changes are allowed because it takes a long time yeah. for the illustrator to do the work, longer than you might think. So if they're going to invest that time, they want to be paid for it. And therefore, if you decide you don't like it, you'll have to pay for it anyway and then abandon it and start again. So that could be very expensive and time-consuming for the author, no doubt about it. Yeah. You need to be pretty sure. Exactly. Pretty sure. And I have heard of some authors who aren't happy with covers and that's... Mm. That must be very upsetting. Thankfully, I have been very lucky. So it's in that an, regard. so it's a real case of doing your homework. In other words, before you approach an illustrator, you need to have a clear idea so. what you want and and where you're going with it. I think so. And then you know, as well, you need a little bit of flexibility because they will have their own artistic ideas. So try to agree as much as possible in advance, so there aren't any shocks and surprises, shall we say? Yeah. Exactly. Now, with Grindlewood, uh, there are lovely black and white drawings yeah. inside each book. With Heart Maiden, there aren't. It's just the cover, the full cover back and front. Oh, it's a slightly okay. different style of book, yeah. I just want to ask Liddy, Liddy, what was your impressions when you saw the illustrations compared? Because you read a lot of book with illustrations. So what did you think of mm. the illustrations? Um, yeah, I like the illustrations, but um, I oh. I really like um like books that don't have illustrations as well mm -hmm. because oh, then you can uh, use your imagination to right. um think of how the characters look. But is that because you're getting more experience reading and you're getting older? Do you think younger kids would like to have the illustrations? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I suppose it's probably just an age thing, Jackie. I think so too. Yeah, because Grindelwald is really for age eight up to 12 mm. and then the heart maiden series is really for age 10 and older ah right okay so, so that's, that's why we yeah and it's slightly longer book but it yeah. doesn't look any bigger because there aren't any illustrations inside yeah because so you liddy you read uh, what was the recent harry potter book that you read uh harry potter and the order of the phoenix and how big was that book it was the biggest in the book and it had oh. i think it was uh 800 pages right oh, but my no no pictures at all in that 
Just little tiny ones every now and again. No, they weren't. Wow. Not at all. So I think, it's, again, it's probably boils down to, uh, you know, how far you've gone. If you threw that at a, at a seven or eight-year-old normally, I think, who hasn't read that much, they might find it very difficult, do you think, Jake? Yeah. Yeah. And Jackie, um, just uh, I think Lydia has a, a, an important question she wanted to ask you about. Uh, yeah. Do you think your book can, uh, books can be movies? Oh, my goodness. I love hearing that question. <laughs> and I'm often asked that question in school classes and the whole class wants to be in the movie well I would love that wouldn't it be fun and mm. um, I wouldn't mind if it was a cartoon movie or if it was a real live action movie yeah I think it would be great fun but you know authors themselves can't make movies really it's a very expensive difficult thing to do all I can do really is hope that people read my books and like them and the more people that do maybe someday a movie maker will hear about it and want to make a movie. But there are so many books that would make good movies. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. There must be a huge queue. But it would be great fun. I, I'd, lo- I'd love, to, love to see that. love to see it on the screen. And the other thing is, of course, with movies is that that, that genre, though, is very popular with children. I think, you know, it used to be, say, The Hunger Games and Divergent, but I think that kind of burnt itself out very quickly um, because they were probably too dis- too too depressing in some ways. But I think with the with the uh, fantasy genre, it can yeah. be it can be kind of it can tug at the heartstrings, but it can also play a part where children can really invest in the project, whether they're watching it or whether they're reading it. I think so too. And again, it might boil down to whether it's a cartoon or live action. Mm. Um, cartoon, you could make it for younger children, per- perhaps. But no, yeah. I must say, I enjoy them myself. And um, I think things like Twilight and The Hunger Games and that were probably for a slightly older audience. Yeah, I would have yes. thought them quite hard going for, for youngsters. Yeah. But um, certainly Grindelwood as a live action, I think, could be quite funny as well. Mm. Certainly when you get, uh, when Lydia gets to the end of the series, she'll, she'll come across some of the funnier parts nice. as well as some of the darker parts. So it just there's lots of twists and turns going through the story as you move along. Yeah, and also, Lydia, you have you were watching a, a TV program which was kind of uh, re- resurrected from the 1980s, She-Ra. So what did you think of that? Because it, it wasn't like the original She-Ra at all. Sure yeah. it wasn't. So what, why mm-hmm. did you like the actual cartoon itself in terms of how it was presented yeah. and so on? And do you think you would have preferred She-Ra to be a movie or uh, the cartoon as it was, Lydia? It'd be really good if all the cartoons were stuck together like one would be big ah, movie. Well, you see, yeah, that's, that's, really that's, nice. that's the thing you can do with Netflix. It doesn't matter anymore. You can obviously yeah. do that with Netflix. In each one of the episodes, it's kind of... Um, it, so they're kind of like chapters in a book. Yeah, right. Uh, so they have different adventures, but it all kind of leads to the same thing sometimes. So if you're giving Jackie that's some... If you're giving Jackie some feedback, then... So would you think Grindelwood would make a good TV series rather than a movie? Yeah. Well, there you go. Good. Oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so probably have an idea. And Con- each ch- um, episode could be one of the chapters. Lovely. And actually, they can do wonderful things now with animation. So if you have a live action movie, all the animals, for example, some of them could be actually real, but some of them could be, you know, uh, what they call CGI and Marvellous graphics that they yeah. can put into a live action movie so that it just looks so real. It's, it's marvellous. And I think with the likes of Netflix, Amazon and so on, and to mm. a lesser extent Disney, there there probably is a, a potential for books like yourselves to be given consideration more than in the past because there's just, they're churning out stuff so much that it's, um, yeah. you know, it's possible for them to do it and they, they, they need it. You know, because they need that that continuous um, production. Stream. Yeah, mm. so I think they, they, certainly I, I've realized from looking at Netflix that there's far more uh, varying, you know, varied sort of ideas and concepts that co- that are coming out that maybe ma- mainstream TV production companies wouldn't have ran with. Yeah, but, well, I hope so, because that certainly would give more of us a chance, I suppose. <laughs> exactly, to yeah, exactly. And I say, children have such an appetite for these things now that... Um, they need loads and loads of content so with a bit of luck you never know yeah exactly do you have any plans for future books well yes Um, right at the moment I have as I mentioned Harp Maiden which is another magical tale Uh, the first book came out at the end of last year the second one I'm just proofing at the moment it'll be out in September 
And the third book in the trilogy will be out next year. So that is, as I said, another magical adventure tale, this time with the musical element, another thing that I love, about a magical harp. So um, that will be, that's really what I'm working on at the moment, proofing the final of book two and then into the proofing book three and getting them out there. And hopefully we'll be back in the schools to be able to tell all the children about them as well. Yeah, that's really Brindlewood, important. Yeah. as well as Harp Maiden. Yeah, it's nice to have something different Excellent. to talk about as well, a new one. Yeah. And it, so Harp Maiden part one is out at the moment? It is. Okay, yes. so that's all in good bookshops, guys. You can get them in bookshops just like... Uh, Woodbine Books in Kilcullen and uh, oh, they'd be absolutely yeah, yeah they, I, so, I, so I presume the local bookstores for you are very important oh yes gosh I visit them as much as I possibly can um, my local one is uh, Do Brays and Bray yep well but known I've certainly been into your, your local one there yeah. Woodbine the girls Don, there. Yeah. yeah it's amazing yeah Dawn is great for us. She 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 gives Lydia a lot of books to read, and um, you know it, we wouldn't be able to do this without Dawn's uh, start of help right. for us. It was really really uh, brilliant. Very good. Yeah, so I yeah, think it's important for authors like yourself that you get in get in with the local bookshops because it could be a huge advantage because you can get a pocket of children, can't you? Absolutely, and I often go into bookshops and do readings for various class groups that come and visit, like I do in the libraries. And then other times I go into the schools. It's really whatever way the school class wants to do it, whether they want to go into the shop, the library, or have it in-house in the school. Yeah. But it's great. It's a lovely environment as well. And the bookshops work so hard to help their patrons. And they're really keen to help children enjoy books, find what they want, and stick with reading, not just when they're little, but all their life long. Yeah, it's true. And as well, I think libraries as well have become so mm. progressive nowadays. When you and I were children, libraries were kind of, you know, they're a bit stiff. Now they're like they amazing were. places to visit. And it's just, Liddy, you, I think you, we have a local library in Balator. I don't think you can like yeah. it enough, can you? Mm. It's amazing. It's just a fantastic place. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful that we still have them actually in this day and age. I think it's they're working very hard, you know, to keep them Absolutely. open. Absolutely. They're doing so much more than they used to. As you say, they used to be almost scary when you went in. You had to be so quiet and uh, everyone was very strict about it. This is 100 years ago when yeah. I was little. But they're so welcoming and so helpful and so knowledgeable. And as you said, doing so much more now to um, invest in the community and help people and encourage people uh, with, with everything to do with books and reading and information it's it's a marvellous service to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Jackie, I think we have one final question from Lydia. Great, uh, yep. This is this is the, probably the most important question. She always asks mm. this of her authors. What would be your ad advice for authors? Ooh, for authors or aspiring authors. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. I have loads of information for you. I'll try to keep it brief, but <laughs> if you want more, my website, Grindlewood.com, has a short list and a long list of writing tips. Great stuff. Now, Brilliant. the first few things. You're doing most of them already, Lydia. Read lots of books because reading lots of books helps fire your imagination and you need your imagination if you're going to write a book. Uh, practice your writing and write about things you like. So why would you write about something you don't like? Write about things that you enjoy. And that will help you to think of ideas and help you get involved in your own story, which makes it easier to write. And obviously, you know, when you're in school, listen carefully to what the teachers tell you about writing, how to write, how to plan a story, checking your writing, making it the very best it can be, because you're the only one who can write your story. Nobody else can. So always be proud of it and make it the very best thing you do. And each time you write then, you will be improving every single time until you're getting better and better and better. And maybe you really will become an author. That is brilliant advice. And of course, now it's time, the most important time that we get uh, you to give us a plug on what you're, how you're doing. I know you mentioned your website, but um, are you on Facebook or Twitter, Jackie? I am on both Facebook, Grindlewood.com and Twitter at Grindlewood. I'm on both of those. Um, I find that enough to manage just at the moment. <laughs> and the website, as I said, grindlewood.com. Though it does have information on Harp Maiden as well. I just felt it was easier to hang on to the, the name Grindlewood 
as it was my first book. No, it's a great idea. Um, yeah, it's a great, and it's yeah. a brilliant. It's a it's a beautiful website. It's nice and simple. It's great to go in. You can see the books right in front of you, and you go onto the main page. And oh, um, you. you know, there's also, as you said, uh, stuff about um, the schools and libraries, and and of course, there's a breakdown of Secrets of Grindelwald without going into That's too right. much detail, which is which is nice and uh, which is nice and simple for kids to get into. And of course, um, just if you give me just to let me know, there are many books is in Grindelwald, just so that we can let, let our listeners know. Certainly, there are five books, and as with every series, I recommend you read them in the right order, and they are numbered on the spine of the book. Brilliant. Five books in Grindlewood, and there will be three books for Heart Maiden, Lovely. and then I'll move on to something new after that. And I presume they're available in all good bookshops? All good independent bookshops, and online, in the usual places, and in local libraries too. Brilliant. And finally, uh, the last question I wanted to ask you was, are your books available online as in ebooks? Yes, they are. Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All of them uh, through Amazon at the moment. Yeah, I don't think anybody else is selling ebooks. Mm hmm for me just Amazon for the moment super uh, as you know because although we do always encourage that people read books in their original book format it is important mm. you know sometimes children don't have access to that of course so it's it's also nice to be able to get get that as well Jackie Absolutely. thanks so much for taking the time out today to um to talk to us and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did absolutely thank you very much both of you Ken and Lydia Lydia I think you're absolutely marvellous clearly a wonderful reader and what you're doing with the podcast with Ken is absolutely fantastic. A great help to other readers out there. So well done to you. And thank you so much for having me. I absolutely loved every minute of our chat. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And of course, Jackie, thank you so much as well for your support, because I know uh, you, you do a lot of retweeting of air nonsense. So that's I much sure. appreciated. I certainly do. Not <laughs> all. You're helping lots and lots of girls and boys. Well, that's the goal. Of, that's the goal of the podcast. Yeah, it is to encourage people. We we do this for free. We do it for a laugh, and we do it for fun. And it's great fun to sit down with my daughter and do this. And and uh, you know, hopefully, it will inspire kids out there to do their own podcasts. You know, that's what yeah. we are. We're not in competition. We're in promotion. So, um, you know, if Fabulous. if uh, we can get podcasting, booktastic podcasts in a free franchise around the world, that would be brilliant. Because at the end of the day, it helps children to read, but it also helps authors like yourself who who are who are not in the you know not on the kind of the big book list. So it's it's important that we can we can do that you know so that eventually you will get onto the big book list yeah oh, thank you very much it's great and to keep children reading is so important otherwise they're missing out on so much fun yeah There's absolutely. so many great books out there so enjoy them all thank you very much jackie guys you've been listening to episode 18 of lydia's booktastic podcast um thank you so much to our guest jackie burke of course you can check out jackie's work on grindlewood.com uh, it's fantastic books there so don't forget to go and have a look and see and uh, hopefully we will be back soon with episode 19 so guys take care have a good time keep reading bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.